Huh? Huh? Oh! Hello. Didn't see you there. I don't know if it's because of our education or what have you, uh, but I think we tend to imagine that animals are mostly the animals that just either help each other or eat each other, and that's kind of it. Parasites are the tiny little creepy crawlies, and they're just a few bad ones or something like that. I don't know why they're framed like that, because we have found that almost every living thing on Earth has some sort of parasite. And somewhere between 50% or you know, a majority of animals on Earth have some parasitic form in their life cycle. Most of life on Earth is parasite. I think sometimes it helps to reframe life in the way that it actually is. Things taking advantage of other things is just as valid a way to live as a lion hunting a wildebeest. I don't wanna hear anything about the pronunciation of this. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections about the previous videos that we've done on this channel and address them directly in a format that you're probably more used to seeing and other parts of the internet, except that we do not heavily rely on jump cuts. What do you think? I can't string two sentences together? Come on, I'm better than that. Later on in this video, I'll tell you what's coming up next on this channel, but for now, to your comments and questions. So on the last episode of Because Science, I was taking the iconic opening scene from Halo 3, where Master Chief, the super soldier, falls from space all the way to the dirt of Africa and smashes into a crater and survives. I said that given all the parameters that we could establish and estimate that weren't too far off base, I think that Master Chief would have an abnormally high chance of surviving a fall from space like that. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Bob Matthews who says, I actually had a great uncle that survived a malfunctioning parachute jumping behind enemy lines at D-Day. And you're absolutely right, trees and snow definitely saved him. Granted, snow saved him from a lot of things while he was over there. Mines and wet and bad powder and the mortar shells too. Love the channel. I hope Senpai will notice me. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for sharing your story. That's amazing. And there's a lot of examples of people falling from great distances, specifically during war times because they were being shot down out of airplanes and it is incredible that your great uncle was lucky enough like Master Chief to survive. I'm glad that he did. I made it sound weird, but I am glad. And you can consider yourself noticed by this guy. Sen Senpai means teacher, right? Our next comment comes from M Davies 97131. The other one was taken. Who says, to be fair, terminal velocity is also impacted by Master Chief's orientation and application of other physics like drag. He would be smart enough to use, uh, with Cortana's help, some way to slow him down like skydivers do with different ways that they fall with their bodies. Yes, I agree that Master Chief is probably smart enough to know that the orientation of your body when you're falling through the air determines the air resistance on your body quite a bit. M. Davies actually goes on to say that when skydivers really want to fall quickly, they change their drag coefficient by changing the shape of their bodies in the air, and they can fall up to 143 meters per second, 321 miles per hour, over a third the speed of sound. That is a huge difference, and I think that you're right. If Master Chief knew that, he probably would have increased his drag by making himself a very irregular shape, which would create a lot of turbulence at the boundary layer of his limbs and the air going past it, which would create more drag, and then he'd go slower and he wouldn't hit the ground as fast. Okay, I love this kind of analysis. It has nothing to do with the episode, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Hendrick M says, I was thinking about Infinity War, how it ended, spoiler alert, and I thought about the fo following. If 50% of people were instantaneously removed from the planet, Hendrick goes on to say, Imagine the additional knock-on effects from that happening. Uh, bus drivers, doctors performing life-saving surgeries, uh, pilots in airplanes. There would be so many other knock-on effects from removing that many people immediately from society, especially in cities where the population densities are higher, that it wouldn't just be eliminating 50% of people. Hendrick estimates it would be 60% or more of people because so many people would die just from that catastrophe of removing humans from the human system. I think that is why everyone is saying, why can't 
Thanos just increase the number of resources available and that would solve the overpopulation problem. But I, I think you were absolutely right, Hendrik. There would be so many little effects that we're not even thinking about. They show it in the after credit scene with planes falling out of the sky and that, but it would be so much worse. Imagine people running uh, nuclear reactors. Imagine uh, people running our power grid uh, just being immediately turned to, ah, it wouldn't help humanity or another civilization immediately, it would be the worst catastrophe ever. And then get better? I don't know. I'm not a big purple man. What do I know? Oh, greetings from Germany. Hello. Hello? Halo! Back to the episode! Our next comment comes from Roy, who says, why the distinction between whether or not he jumped from space or two kilometers from the ground? He still hits terminal velocity, so he hits the ground with the same force, yeah? Well, I made the distinction because if you fell from space space, like above the Kármán line, let's say, 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, because there is no air resistance, or very little air resistance because of how thin the atmosphere is up there, it is officially space, you can keep accelerating under Earth's gravity without air resistance, and you can get very, very high velocities, faster than the speed of sound if you're falling from orbit. And if Master Chief was doing that, we'd have to calculate what would happen to his suit when he encountered the atmosphere at those speeds, which we don't know because we don't know how high he jumped out. So what I went with is the two kilometers that was mentioned in the game and assuming he's already in the atmosphere because I think it would be harder, even harder than what we did, to estimate the effects of superheated air on Master Chief's suit because we have no idea how those things would interact. So I only included the fall forces and stopping times and stuff because that is easier to do and I only have so much time in a day. Our next comment comes from Templar Bear who says, quoting me, it's not miraculous, it's just luck. Really? Could you define either one of those terms? Is how I feel like you said this? Sure, miraculous implies that the laws of the universe are being suspended one time and in your favor. Now, if we accept that there are our laws and limitations to this universe at all, we also have to admit that they cannot be suspended for one random person in the entire universe just because it benefits them slightly. So I do not ascribe to the idea that there are in fact miraculous events. That's why I went with Lucky. And by Lucky, I mean that Master Chief seems to have the attributes and physical interactions and experience that provide him with a higher than normal chance for surviving very unlikely scenarios, which would make him, by definition, colloquially speaking, lucky. It's not a very sciencey term, no. I know that. Our next comment comes from Zella Nall, who says, I was always told that mass had absolutely nothing to do with the fall speed, and instead it had everything to do with air resistance. You are right, but only for objects in a vacuum. As you pointed out later in your comment, we have videos like this, which is a real astronaut dropping both a hammer and a feather on the surface of the moon, and they fall in exactly the same way. Two objects ignoring air resistance will fall at exactly the same rate if they're under the exact same force, in this case gravity, and their mass and their shape have nothing to do with how they're falling, like the hammer and the feather on the moon. But when you add in air resistance, air resistance and drag has everything to do with the velocity of the object, the area that object is presenting to the fluid it is moving through, the density of that fluid, the coefficient of drag that object has based on its shape, etc., etc. So, two objects falling through the atmosphere, depending on their shape, will have different drag forces on them, which will be balanced by their weight force, which is what you get on the moon, but there is no air resistance. So if those weight forces are different, the drag forces will affect them differently. Imagine it like this. What if you had two feathers, two identical feathers, and you drop them in our atmosphere, so they had the same shape and coefficient of drag and everything, except one weighed one million pounds and the other was a normal feather. Which one do you think would fall through the atmosphere more quickly? It's the one that is a million pounds because the amount of drag force being put on it compared to its weight is very, very small, where the drag on a normal feather is enough to make it drift just oh so gently to the ground. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I got to give to an email I got a couple days ago and it had nothing to do with the episode, but you'll see why. It is from Clue Hendricks, who gave me a rubric for how to analytically determine a super nerd based on points. The categories here are length, supposition, or detail expansion, host correction, math, and just the WTF factor. And they all have points assigned to them, and if you read it, it's all very thorough and amazing, and you are a super nerd, Clue Hendrix. Oh, 
and I'm going to use this going forward to analyze all of you, so it better be good, because I have numbies now. But of course, I'm not always right. I put a full squirt of face cream on my toothbrush earlier, and I brushed my teeth with what was very much not toothpaste. Then I had to take a towel and wipe my mouth out. Felt terrible. Our first correction comes from Merrick Rosowski, who says, hey Kyle, great episode. Woo! I just wanted to point something out. In the intro video where Chief was shown soaring through, uh, down from the, the spaceship, both the shuttle and Chief are red hot and glowing. In your estimates, you declare that it would take him 15 seconds to reach terminal velocity, but that would only be if he was to jump out of the shuttle. You're right, Merrick. I used 15 seconds. I said it would take 15 seconds for uh, Master Chief to reach terminal velocity, but the conditions that I actually used was if Master Chief jumped out of a stationary object and just fell under Earth's gravity with no initial velocity that would cause him to heat up. I considered him basically like jumping out of a hot air balloon two kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and that's where I got the 15 seconds for him to get up to terminal velocity. You are right. I did not include the initial velocity that you would imply because he is glowing hot. He must have been going very, very fast for that to happen. Many times Mach 1. But because we have no initial velocity value that I think we can reasonably estimate, and he's changing direction and falling at a weird angle, I went with the most, again, simple explanation that what if he just dropped from that height? So I kind of ignored that part of it because it would be very, very complicated to estimate all the forces and heat and temperature on him for every single second he was falling through the atmosphere, so we went with the more simple one. Our next correction comes from Matthew Savage, who says, Hey Kyle, two things not of serious importance. Uh, call him Spartan117, not Soldier John117, because that misclasses him. Very picky. Second thing, when you had the HUD up from Halo on the screen, I noticed you had Thor's hammer as your active weapon. You had ammo ticks instead of an energy remaining bar. That is all. Look, who's going to know what kind of ammo loadout screen HUD Thor's hammer is going to have. You, or perhaps me, who could say? Our next correction comes from Luke Singer, who says, hey Kyle, love the show. Woo! And they go on to say, I don't think a rat would die from falling down a thousand meter mine shaft because cats can fall with a 90% survival rate from an average fall distance of five and a half stories. And that's amazing that kitties are that uh, resilient. Luke is saying if cats are that resilient, then the, then the smaller uh, rats that I said would be broken by falling a thousand meters, uh, then rats are probably fine. Point A. Point A is that it's not my quote, it's from JBS Haldane. So I don't know if he actually did that. Point two is that I love facts about cats, and I offer one to you in return. 50% of kids will die if they fall out of a building that's three stories or taller. Now you know, and it's not just burning inside of me. Our next correction comes from Heather Grondahl, who says, first off, Kyle, absolutely love your show! Hey, thank you. Couple of things about this video. The first discrepancy might be rather, uh, pika yoon, but you drew the wrong kind of trees when explaining what kind of trees the man landed in before he hit the stool. Really, Heather? No! I'm moving on. By far the nerdiest correction this week at the time I'm filming this episode. No, I'm not gonna read the rest of Heather's comment. The nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to one-time super nerd Ryuman90, who says, hello there, I think you missed a detail in your numbers. Master Chief has an energy shield that absorbs kinetic energy from bullets, so it must take some energy from a full body slam into the ground. I didn't consider the energy armor in my calculations because I didn't have a good starting point for it, but Ryuman90 does, who uses the fact that it takes four bursts from a battle rifle to deplete Master Chief shields and then calculates the kinetic energy and, and works out the force that sh it should be able to take before the shield dissipates, and then you could subtract that from the impact force that we calculated. I love your thinking. That is a brilliant way to look at maybe how much force the shield can take. I do, however, disagree with the distance used in your calculation because you want uh, how far it would take the bullet to come to a stop and not how far it travels along uh, the gun as it's being fired, but you're so close and your head's there and I love it. And for that, you are a two-time super nerd. Oh.
Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is gonna be because you have already seen it. Today, actually. Two days earlier than everyone else. And you can get other premium Nerdist and Geek and Sundry content and discounts on new merch, which we'll get to. But if you have not subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is going to be why vaporization is so much worse than you've ever seen. That's right, in the next episode of Because Science, I'm explaining why the neat and tidy Star Trek style vaporization is so wrong in that it's not gross enough. Real terms have real meanings, and if you apply the term vaporization to the thing, a person, you get another thing, which is super gross. But you'll see. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, and leave me all of your comments, questions, and corrections. If you want to be a super nerd at facebook.com slash because science, you, oh, it's right here. YouTube.com slash Because Science and at Because Science on Instagram and Twitter, I think it's pronounced. And do that. And guess what? We have new merchandise. Not only can you get this very comfortable and stylish new Because Science shirt, which I recommend because I only wear things that are comfortable, but we also have mouse pads, which I want you to do all of your nerdy calculations on from now on. And we have new mugs that are just as branded. Ah, marketing. You can go to shop.nerdist.com and look at the Because Science collection if you want to pick up any of that stuff. And if you subscribe to Alpha, you can go to the store on Alpha and get 10% off all this new merch. It supports me and it supports the show and everyone who works on it. So if you do buy anything, thank you so much. And also, this is a business and sometimes the sponsorships do not exactly fit what the video is about. That's just how businesses run sometimes. So you can stop commenting about it. I know. It's cool. Don't worry, we get to do fun stuff as a result. And finally, don't forget, oh, look, what's over yonder?